Welcome to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. Our goal is to help you maximize your church's potential. You'll hear from top leaders in children's, student, and family ministry about the principles and practices they use. Now here's your host, Nick Blevins. What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 191 of the podcast. In this episode, I talk with Jason Young all about new families and guest retention. And when we have new folks visit our church, how do we help them come back? And we talk about his book, The Comeback Effect. We talk about the season that we're in where the only new families we might be seeing are online and people that are attending online for the first time. And as usual, you can get all the links and notes and all of that at nickblevins.com slash episode 191. A couple of things to let you know about before we jump in. One is that this episode is sponsored by Serve HQ. Stop using clunky and unsafe communication tools in ministry. And with a new tool from Serve HQ called Huddle Up, your email, your text announcements can live alongside your team chats in one unified platform that's built just for churches, which is, of course, something that's being used really well right now in this season where we're not gathering together as much. Maybe churches are just starting to meet in person again, but communication is still really, really important. And so with ease and accountability built into the forefront of the Huddle Up tool, you might want to use that for your church, not just now, but even going forward, having one central place to have all that communication and accountability, but they have some options for how they want to receive that communication, which of course everybody likes. Go to nickblevins.com slash servehq to find out more. And then if you're listening to this, when it comes out, we've got a new family retention webinar that we're hosting Thursday, May 21st. 1230 Eastern, we're going to walk through the five-part framework that we at Ministry Boost have created to help churches retain new families. It's really for anybody, for anybody. It doesn't have to be a family, uh, but that's our spin. That's our focus. We're kind of keep, you know keeping an eye on that, but this framework would work for guests in general. It could be your church-wide retention plan, and we have a resource that we've created with that. So the webinar is great. It'll be free if you don't or can't spend the money right now to get the prepackaged resource and have some of those steps done for you. That's fine. The webinar, we're going to try to give you as much away as we can in the webinar. And then in the resource, the actual plan, you can buy for a limited time for $25. Uh, Normally, it would be $100. And that'll be, I think, available for the next two or three weeks before that price goes to its normal point. And it has all the pieces of the framework, follow-up scripts, job descriptions for volunteers. I mean, it just has everything they're done for you where you would go in and edit it, tweak it, apply it to your church, figure out exactly what your path and plan and framework will be for your retention plan. But 80 to 90% of it could be created for you with this resource. So even if you missed the live webinar, you can watch it on a replay. Just go to ministryboost.org to check that out. But let's jump into my conversation now with Jason Young about helping guests come back. Well, we have Jason Young on the podcast today. Welcome, Jason. Hey, thank you for letting me be here. Yeah, tell us about you and your family and some of your church experience. You've been in a couple churches that I think pretty much everybody will know about. So uh, tell us about that before we jump in. Yeah, um, well, I love the local church, and so I've been fortunate um, to – I've worked at First Baptist Woodstock, which is outside of Atlanta, and Life Church uh, and North Point Ministries. And so it's been a fun learning opportunity. They're all three very different. And so I've, I've learned something new at each of those places, but both, uh, all of them great in their own respect. Yeah. And you're still located in the Atlanta area. Is that right? Yeah, I am. So I rolled off North Point Ministries last fall and still in the Atlanta area. Um, I write and, uh, coach leaders, both church world and in the business. So just in organizations, um, and consult on how do you, how can you be a better leader? How can you lead uh, from a healthy place? And then how do you create remarkable experiences that whether you call them guests or customers, that they want to come back and they want to interact with you, whether that's coming back online or coming back to a physical space, especially in the season that we're in. Mm-hmm. And you wrote, you you know, written some books, you got some more coming out, but the one that'll probably be uh, the center of the conversation we're going to have today is called The Comeback Effect. So tell us about what that book is. And then I just want to dig into what did it actually look like? What did the plans actually look like, you know, at maybe North Point or maybe North Point and Life Church? You know, just talk about what it looked like on the ground. But tell us about the Comeback Effect book. Yeah, it's, it's I say, pretty simple. Um, I'm not the brightest guy in the world. I think I just try things. And so uh, Jonathan and I wrote it, wrote it together. And it's really, how do you, how do you use hospitality, which is, we could talk about how do you define that, but how do you use hospitality 
in a way that compels a guest uh, to want to come back. And I think it's super important. And it may not be the things that people typically focus on. Um, and I, it actually might be a little bit easier than we think. Yeah, and I like how a lot of the book focuses on uh, even chapter two, the title, Create a Culture, Not a Job Title. Probably mm-hmm. gets at the, to me, gets at the essence of the book that it's about like the experience you're creating. And sure, there's a system and there are steps. And I want to talk all about what is the system and what are the steps. But I want to hear you also talk about like the book talks about why. Why do you do that that way? Yeah. What are you trying to help them feel or experience at this point? And then what about here and all that? So I'd love to start with, uh, and maybe it's a big overview. What was like the, you know, the primary plan or the path that you were hoping guests would take when they come to, let's say, North Point for the first time to taking some type of step that got them really plugged in, whether there's a group or serving or something like that. What was the plan there? Because I know a lot of churches are having that conversation, have been. What is our plan You know, from the moment you come through the door to getting plugged in? A lot of churches have a discipleship plan. So, hey, if we, if we can get somebody mm-hmm. to do these things, we know they're going to help grow their faith. But they might be lacking mm-hmm. on this part of it, you know, retention, assimilation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what did that yeah. look like at North Point? So what's interesting about the culture at North Point, and it's it's different at, at Life Church, and, you know, it's different. So it's it could be similar, could be different. But there's autonomy uh, on each individual campus. And so it's just kind of how Andy leads. And so he kind of gives you autonomy. And, I mean, you don't go run free and crazy, but – you do really have this this permission to to try to try to make it better, and other churches are you know watching yours and learning. And so, I think Andy gives this permission to try. I mean, I even felt that personally. I worked for him directly for about two years right before I rolled off, and you just you you get that you know sense every. So I say that to say every campus did it a little bit different, and in fact, for years. Um, Every campus did this thing called Next. And so they would promote it from the stage. You would come uh, to this little gathering. It would be a more presentation thing than a conversation. And I think we all began to sense, hey, the presentation thing is like not not that helpful anymore. So we campus by campus started dropping off doing that. Um, And I think at, at some point only one did it or they brought it back. And but they they even made it different. So the question was, we need to make sure that we have a clear path and we need to make sure that we talk about it every single week, not just from the platform, but from everywhere. And the temptation, and I don't know, you know, for, for pastors or next gen leaders listening uh, to this conversation, the, the temptation can be to think weekend to weekend. But what we forget is the guest the, the volunteer, the attendee, they don't, they don't think like that. Um, we are a piece in the 27 pieces of their life, and they may not get what we're saying on Saturday or Sunday in our weekend experiences, but they may get it on Tuesday when they're sitting in a carpool line picking up little Johnny and Sally or before they hop on a plane or on a plane. You know, So we have to constantly think, where are our attendees? Where are our potential attendees? And so getting out in front of them. So the pathways look different for every campus. But right before I rolled off, we, uh, Andy and I specifically worked on a project that we wanted to utilize a website that kind of, um, that didn't necessarily start with the church, because a lot of times we want to start with the church versus starting with the person. And I think businesses that do this well, um, they start with you, your preferences, what you're like, and then kind of lead you down a path into how the church can help. And so I think one of the phrases we used to say, or it's kind of a few little sentences, it's, you know, like life can be complicated. You want to get it right. We can help. You know, in fact, um, I so saw you the, know, the website was that, rebranded with that, right? Is, am I right about that? Yep, that's right. That's what I thought. That's yeah. right. So, yep, Andy and, and the team of us, uh, you know, landed on that thing. Andy kind of prompted more, more of it. In fact, I think a version of that is on his website right now about leadership. But really, it's okay. It's complicated. It's complicated for us. You want to get it right? We can help. All right. How do we help? Well, let's start with the person 
and not necessarily start with us. Because if, you know, to, to borrow Donald Miller's, uh, you know, who's in a marketing space idea and terms, we're the guide and we're not the hero. So how can we come alongside an attendee to be a guide to show them here are options, here's, you know, this and that. So we, we built this website um, to kind of use people uh, or to, to use it to guide people. And it was remarkable that the first Sunday we ended up having like 1,900 people at one campus use it. It was, it was remarkable. Um, I think the process could have been better on the back end, um, but, you know, we learned and, and tweaked. And so it's just, I think sometimes instead of starting with the church, Start with a person and guide them to what the church offers or what they need, and this is how the church can match that. So it, every campus is different, and so I can't tell you one does this and this, and you know they're not all the same. But I think more mindset-wise, an approach is start with the person attending and help them along the way to decide what's best for them based on what you offer. And then make sure that it's super, super clear. And the last thing I'll say is I think sometimes, and I can be guilty of this myself, I think sometimes we think it's clear, but we're so close to it and it, we're so familiar with it, it makes sense to us. So one way to test it is ask people who don't know anything, family members, friends. In fact, I was on a phone call just on Monday and I had uh, somebody that knew nothing about what we were meeting about, listen in and asked him after the fact, how was that? And he says, that was not clear at all. And I was like, that's perfect feedback. That is so helpful. What would you advise? You know, that kind of thing. So I think if you're thinking about a pathway, think about, you know, if you're leading volunteers or students or families or just the person in the, in the, in the crowd, think about them first and then build something that can meet a need. But be the guide and not don't try to be the hero like we can solve everything. We have this for you. You don't have to be that. No, nobody expects that. Now, I want to I think we could maybe even just think about one campus and you could just kind of pick one and how they do it, because I would love to dig into more of the the process that they use. But I have to ask about this website. So I saw that you all rebranded um, your website, the website there months ago. It had that uh -huh. language of. Um, you know, we can help and, but now it looks different, right? Cause with coronavirus mm -hmm. and North, you know, not meeting in person, that's a little bit changed. So when you say 1900 people went and did something on the site, to me, that sounds like you weren't just pushing like new people who've never attended there. You were pushing your own attenders there. What was it about? What was yes. The so yeah, the goal was not just for new ad attenders uh, at all. In fact, it was people who weren't a part of community who weren't volunteering, you know, and I think sometimes we can be guilty of assuming that we know, you know, reality. Well, when we got those numbers back, it, they were staggering um, to, to see, you know, some people had been going there for three years and never done anything. And so maybe you're listening to this today and you can empathize. You could say, yes, we have those same people in our church. Um, mm -hmm. You're not alone. And so for us, it wasn't just the new person. Um, it was it was the new person, but it was also the person that might have been there five plus years that maybe we haven't said it in a way that connected with you or clear enough that you you understood. And I don't know if it and I, I can't I don't know why it resonated so well. I don't know if it was we took a little reverse approach and started with um, the person and, and not what the church needed or offered. Did that resonate? Maybe. I, I don't know. So if you take one church that used used the website, it wasn't the, the church website. We actually created a, another um, a vanity URL, if you will, and – um, that way we could kind of brand it a bit. And so when people did it, uh, we would follow up with them based on what they included in their, um, in the form. I say form, it was, it was interactive. We had a, an agency, a web agency create it uh, for us. It wasn't a Google form. It was, you know, more interactive and, uh, could be playful. Uh, we took some of the playful pieces out. I tend to be more playful and sarcastic and 
sometimes that may not be so <laughs> professional. So they made it a little bit more professional. Um, but, and then we followed up with them and, you know, tried to get them connected to uh, different things. The big thrust of it, if you will, was recognizing that many attendees were not volunteering. And so that that really was the the pain that drove the project, if you will. And and I ran I ran with the project in conjunction with Andy and our leadership team. And so the pain was a lack of volunteers. But the more that we uncovered it, um, you know, there were community group you know things. And and what's interesting, and I don't know how you know you listening today, what your church is like, but. A lot of times churches will, whatever they talk about the most is what they value the most. So, Mm, you know, what I felt, this is just Jason speaking. I don't want to put this on anybody else. I felt that groups got more stage time, social time, um, kind of was the, the pride of the overall ministry, which groups are amazing. I mean, amazing. What I didn't feel uh, the same way about was the world of volunteers. And I wonder if we were, if we had, this is, was my belief. We have a systemic volunteer challenge because we haven't put the same effort, strategy, celebration, resources, or expectations into that space. It, It didn't mean we didn't have a lot of volunteers. We just didn't have as many as we should have, nor were they as healthy as they should be. And so that was kind of the precipice of focusing on that. But then we expanded it and it became, you know, it became something more. And we've tried all kinds of things from talking about it one Sunday a month to next to stopping by the space in the lobby, um, you know, which can be effective. And I think maybe more than anything is you, I say you, including myself, we have to be willing to em- to to embrace something new and not commit to it for a lifetime if we need to be nimble um and many of you <laughs> you would say oh i'm learning that this season of my life me too me too so mm. i think it's thinking through where are we right now what's the pain what's the problem how do we solve it what what are solutions what can we try? What can we grow into? You know, and, and churches are notorious. I've worked in them. You know, well, that's not how we do it. Well, you know what? Coronavirus has really thrown a kink in that whole mindset. And some people are just struggling to survive. And you know what? They're like, if I could just survive, then that's a win. And you know what? That's fine. But there's also a mindset that we could take is, you know what? I'm not going to be married to everything that we've done we should be willing to take calculated risks for the sake of people. If people aren't worth it, then you probably are in the wrong business. Um, so you got to be willing to try some new things, be flexible, adapt, um, you know, and, and that's got to be, you know, at the top all the way down to a next gen leader. So I don't, I don't know if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah. Would you say the website worked? Now, again, I know it's a very new idea. I mean, some of it still might sure. be happening right now, but did you feel like it helped you make, help those people connect more? Yeah, I think it did. Um, I think if I could go back and tweak some things, I think I would have tweaked some things on the front end and the back end. Um, and so, uh, I, yeah, I would have, I think it worked. I think it could have been better. And part of that was probably, you know, my fault. Um, and part of it was, you know, you get more people room in the room. Everybody has an opinion. Um, and so that, you know, that that adds a dynamic. But I do think it worked. I think what worked more so was the mindset that we can't keep. And it's so your, people are going to be like, well, that's, duh, I get it. We can't be married to what we've done, especially if we're unhappy with or uncomfortable with the results. And so we have to be willing to embrace. I I don't even know that new is a great idea. Was my, was the idea new? No, I think, no, not at all. In fact, I I saw somebody else, it wasn't a church. It was a business 
that did it. I think I got the idea from BuzzFeed, hmm. you know, and so it's, it's learning what's around us and then adapting it to the space if it works and take a calculated risk and then put the resources behind it. And if it doesn't work, be willing to, to, to not do it or to make it better. Uh, mm-hmm. But to not do anything and then to complain about what you've got, that's silly. Sure. Well, I would love to know, and maybe that, I mean, that was newer, so that was a different approach, but outside of that, and again, campuses did different things at North Point Life Church, where you worked would have been more similar, right? All the campuses would have done it the same way. So you could talk about either one, but whatever you think was good and would be most helpful, what thinking through the process, right, of helping people come back and then take more steps Mm -hmm. and get involved and things like that, once they attended the first time, what were some of the things that you all did to help them come back a second time? And was that the goal? Was the goal you come once and our goal is to get you to come back again? Or was the goal go to something uh, next, the, the, you know, the gallery area where you can meet some people and talk? Like what was the goal after that first attendance? Yeah, and this could be a cliche answer, and if it is, I'm sorry. The I would say the answer to that is what would be the best next step for you? And for some, it's, you know, when we had next or you could go in a space um, in the uh, in the lobby and you could talk to staff or volunteers there. Or if you wanted to go back and talk to somebody in on the guest services team, you know, they could they could help you um, if you uh, none of that was for you. you. You wanted to come back and try it again or you wanted to watch online, see what that's like before you came back. Like, I don't know. There wasn't a prescription a prescriptive um, process for what is right for each person. I do think, and and churches are notorious for this, but so, so are companies, whatever you choose, just be clear. And that's one thing I, I don't think um, I think we struggled with um, is, is, be clear, be clear, be clear, be clear, and then say it again, be clear and say it again. Um, and so I think that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, every church does it differently. Um, you know, Woodstock, uh, has a, a way of doing it. Life church has a way of doing it. Um, and then North point ministries has a way of doing it. And, and your church has a way of doing it where I go now has a way of doing it. And so, I don't know that there's a best way. I do think you have to be, you have to create a culture that is clear and that people understand. Um, For instance, and this is a super simple and maybe even a silly example, Nick, but I can, I will go to a church to, to speak and it could be on a Sunday or it could be an event and they will talk about three to six different things. All I know is I've tuned out. All I want to know is what do you want me to know and what do you want me to do? And so I think, you know, whether you're on in front of volunteers at an event or you're leading uh, students in a next gen space or you're a senior pastor or you're a parent at home, like we have to be clear. What do you want? What do we want them to know and what do we want them to do? And I think filtering things through that can be really helpful as to, well, maybe we don't want want them to know three to five things. So maybe you're, you know, maybe you're here today and it's your first time or you've been here five times and you're trying to figure out what the best next step is for you. Well, guess what? We're not sure. But here's what we do know that and then you could go back to life gets complicated. But at the heart of who you are, you want to get it right, and we can help. Well, how do we do that? Right after this service, you know, and so you can go right into, or uh, we want you to stop by blank, blank, blank dot com. So whatever you want them to do, like build to that and like leave it there. We say, I think sometimes we say too much, thus we often get very little result. So say less, call to action. And just go big and then figure out other ways to tell them what you want them to hear. And in fact, sometimes we just say too much. We just say too much. Say less, repeat it, make it clear, say it again, and just keep over and over and over again. People, 
people have to decipher enough as it is. And I hate that the church adds a layer of complexity of being unclear when sometimes businesses, they, they do it right more so than the church. Hmm. How about, you know, in the book, you talk a lot about, like I said, the, the feeling that you're creating, the culture, yeah. uh, them being known and, and being present. Hmm. Talk a little bit about that. How can churches, you know, do well in that area once somebody has already shown up? and create the kind of feeling and the experience and the culture that we want so that when they leave, maybe they don't even know what the next best step is, but they want to come back for more, yeah, whatever, whatever right. it is, you know, they want to come back. How did, how do you guys practically do that at North point, maybe at life church too? Yeah. I mean, in my experience of not only working in, in those churches, but even helping churches, you know, around the country and even working with, you know, recognizable uh, companies the, the same drive is there. They want guests and they want customers to come back. What's interesting is we can fall in love with how we do what we do and, and think that our functions are the attractive pieces or the, the functions are the is the magnet that draws people back. But what if what if that wasn't the case? What if it was about how you made somebody feel. In fact, I used to tell our teams this. Um, how you feel about a guest walking in will be reflected in how they feel about you when they walk out. Hmm, and so it's just thinking about how do I feel about a guest? How, how do we prepare for a guest? How do we want them to feel? And so you, you break that. You don't just do functions. We're going to do music. We're going to do this. We're going to have this. We're going to, you know, and expect people to, to celebrate you because you have put something on for them. No, that doesn't, that doesn't work. You have to, how does a guest, what are they thinking? So there's a, you know, a psychographic side of things and what do you want them to create? How do you want them to feel? How do you want them to feel in the parking lot? How do you want them to feel at the first door? When they see people in the parking lot of the first door, one of the first things subconsciously they ask themselves is, do they look like me? Do I see me? And if they don't, you got to figure that piece out. You know, do how many people are saying hello to them? Sometimes too too many is too much, and too few can be like, did anybody notice me? Um, and and so there's all these different pieces, and I think a lot of times we we fall in love with our functions. We train our volunteers to fall in love with their functions. When we do functions well, we feel like when our tasks are done well, we feel like we've won. But you can do all those functions well devoid of any feeling. And people can choose to not come back because of how you made them feel. But I'll tell you what. Let me give you an example. This is, un, this is not a church example, but this happened yesterday. So I took my family um, to uh, get the antibody test. You know, we're kind of in this COVID-19 season. So we're mm-hmm. I'm working on creating an experience for uh, large churches and companies to – get antibody tests so they can know who can come back to work and, and can't. So anyways, I took my, my family there because I wanted to experience what a customer of ours in this experience I'm working on was going to feel. Well, I mean, I know what a phlebotomist does. I know what the person at the front desk does. They check you in. The phlebotomist calls you back. They sit you in the chair. You put your arm up. You know, there are all these functions. But what I noticed yesterday in, in this particular lab had very little, if anything, to do. Now, you need to do your function well or it becomes a distraction. They did their functions well. But what they did even better is how they made my whole family feel. We're talking a lab, a lab that we went in to have blood drawn, my kids for the very first time, and then my wife and I. And so it's not like we're going to get ice cream. We're going to have blood drawn. Um but the way that they made my kids feel, the way they made me feel, the the att- uh, attention and care, they didn't know who I was. They didn't know that we were, you know, a partner of theirs and they were performing. Like, they had no idea. It was just who they were. And it was the feeling that I'm telling you the story about right now, not their function, but the way they made us feel. And the companies and the organizations and the churches that do it the best those are the places you want to go back to because they prioritize how how they make you feel. Um, and it's just it's important. We underestimate feelings. In fact, a, an average person has about 25 to 27 emotions an hour. 
And if you think about that, if they're on your campus for an hour or two hours, they could have 25 to 50 plus emotions. And the great thing about it is you can influence those moments. You just have to break every single scenario down that you can. And then you reconstruct it in a way that makes people feel intentionally what you're trying to create in the moment. I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm ta- It's authentic, but you're putting strategy and effort behind it versus, ah, it's fine. Nobody cares. Unfortunately, that's not the case because when people come to your church, you know, whenever the doors open up again, they're not, they're not really comparing you to another church. Some may, especially if they're professional churchgoers. But what people do is they compare you to the shopping mall they went to on Thursday, the grocery store they went to on Tuesday, the gym they went to on Friday, the movie theater they went to on Saturday. That's where they're comparing you to, to everyday moments that they experience. And the church, the church should be the ones that lead out on how people feel, because after all, we have a greater mission and purpose than just, you know, offering a movie or selling a t-shirt at a store. (laughs) Yeah. Did you, in your experience at North Point and at Life Church, in terms of creating that feel and that culture, that experience, um, you know, most of the people listening to this are in kids ministry, student ministry, they're next gen pastors, they're thinking about families with kids. Was there a good, you know, co- cooperation, collaboration among uh, what this looked like for kids and students and the rest of the church? Were they separate things almost, and kids did their own thing? you know, students, their own thing. And then main services did their own thing. Like what did that look like? And what would you recommend? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that, that we figured it out. Um, I think uh, all the campuses were trying to figure out their own thing in, in this regard. From where I sat and still sit, there has to be a partnership between um ministry spaces, ministry environment. So the the adult coming in the door that has a kid in elementary and, you know, preschool or middle school and elementary or one in every, you know, on every level, there has to be a partnership between the quote team, the volunteers, the guest experience pieces related to the, the maybe general areas, the auditorium or whatever. And what's happening in kids spaces, because if you think about it, if you come in the door, that team, you know, sets the stage. Maybe the stage has been set on social media. So even backing it all the way up to social media, to website, to parking lot, to first door, you know, and you begin to go incrementally scene by scene of what a guest is going to experience. And then think about this. Like if, if I, uh, a greeter at a door and Nick comes in and he comes in with his family, I am now, because I've engaged with Nick, I am now responsible for guiding get, uh, Nick just I'm going to walk uh, his family to, you know, every single location, but I'm also going to partner with the, that ministry space, that ministry environment that I'm going to kind of let them uh, pick up. So I bring them, they pick it up, they take care because they're the expert in that particular area. Let's say for, you know, a preschooler because they, the language and the, but what I've done is I've teed them up as I've walked them to that space, right? I maybe have used, um, if I've got a kid in that space, hey, one thing I love is we don't watch kids. We invest in them. In fact, the three, the three things that matter or, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to also ask them questions, not too much. I'm trying to set it up. I come up to a kid area, I tee it up, you know, So-and-so kind of runs point right there. And then I just kind of hang back. And then when that piece is done and you come back out with, you know, said volunteer or staff person, I'm there and I take you to the next spot. So I'm the same person. I'm the common thread, but I've partnered with those environments and I know what they're saying, what they're doing, um, but I'm kind of turning it over to them and then I'm picking it back up. And then when we've taken care of all your kids, I walk you into the auditorium. I uh, show you, you know, a seat. Or in fact, I ask you, do you like sitting in the front of the back? Because I want you to feel a sense of control. Again, it's, it's feeling. What's the big deal? Front or back? It doesn't matter. Um, or if I know that for some reason you're a musician, I'm going to pay attention to that when you told me. And I'm going to take you to the seat in the auditorium that has the best sound. You know, and I'm going to tell you why we're going there. 
So, or if you have a baby and it's your first Sunday, I'm probably going to put you at the door closest to, you know, in case you feel like, you know, you want to step out or you get called out. And again, I may not say that, but again, it, it's feeling. So I know what I'm doing. I know what the other ministers are doing. I'm partnering with them. They know what I'm doing when I bring, oh, hey, Jason, you know, da, 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 hey, Nick, you know, and, and so it's a, it's a partnership. If I'm creating my own thing and they're creating their own thing. And I've seen this, and I've actually, unfortunately, done this. Those moments could clash, or they feel incongruent to me, but they really feel incongruent to the guest, and that's where you mess up. Um, so again, even in the transition of those moments, super, super important. So trying to aim for congruency um, and then consistently delivering that is super important. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things we did years ago. We moved to uh, kind of like unify the team that would be helping new new guests in the lobby, you know, with with mm-hmm. or without kids, and then our check in teams for kids ministry. It's kind of like one team now, yeah. And, you know, tried to have that one person that walks with them. It's a little complicated because now you got to know kids check in and kids ministry, yeah. and you got to know new here. Like you have to know more, but it's like you're saying that helps. That helps the guests because they, you yeah, know, they, they just need one per like they better have one person than three, you know, that they get that's introduced right. to. So that's especially for the introverts, they probably don't want to have three introductions. No, <laughs> no. And but so I, I, I learned, I learned from um, Horst Schultz, who used to run Ritz Carlton. We've done some events together, and I always remember him both speaking it but telling me one on one. He's like, when if. If Nick is staying at one of the Ritz Carlton properties and he comes out and there's a there's a team member in the hallway and Nick says, Hey, my my toilet is leaking. The person in the hallway doesn't go, Oh, well, um, let me go find, you know, and turn it over to another person. That's not how it works. The person in the hallway now is the owner of Nick's problem. Doesn't mean they have to fix it, but they own it. That way Nick doesn't have to go to three, four, five different people. Why? Who wants to do that? It that doesn't feel good. It's like, man, they've got my back. And so if we can help people feel like we're in their corner, we've got their back, and we're going to make it easy on them because they're already coming in with feelings about coming to church. It could be all over the place. And so we've got to figure out how do we reduce those feelings, at least not add to them and become you know a hurdle in their experience. Yeah. As we wrap up, I'd love to ask what thoughts do you have about our current context where churches, most of them are still meeting online only. And so there's just a couple of things I think about as it relates to this. One is, um, you know, new guests who have watched online, but, you know, so they have never come in person. They've only watched online. So there's like a retention <laughs> guest experience, you know, that we're going to kind of create for them. And then there's going looking ahead to the date when churches will gather in person again well, there's a whole retention and guest, you know, comeback effect there, right? Because you want them to go from they were attending online to they're coming back. And, and for those people who were new, you know, they never came. Okay, now we got to see if they're going to show up in person for the first time mm. ever. I mean, what are your thoughts about this as it relates to this current season we're in? Yeah, I'm no expert, so I'm not even going to pretend. I definitely have no prescription on what a church should and shouldn't do. Um, I'm an amateur at at, at those things. I I am watching what churches are doing. I I think some churches will abandon what they're currently doing to return to what is what they knew. And and I don't I don't know if that is is wise because they could reach a new, you know, a new population. I also don't think churches should walk in when they quote go back and assume that it's going to be like it was. And I think we, I think in our brains, we say, Oh, I know that. But I think behaviorally that's, what's going to be hard because we're going to default to what is familiar and what we know. And sometimes we might even abandon what has been new, innovative and effective in the season. So my, my thoughts, I don't even want to call wisdom, but my thoughts are you're going to feel an enormous amount of pressure to make a decision to, to go back, especially if churches, your friends or in your community are doing the same. I think you've got to make the best decision for you. 
I think you've got to make the best decision for the community and those attending. You've got to think those things through. I think think step by step by step. And not only for those attending, but don't forget volunteers. You know, and, and when you make a decision, make sure that you you measure and you count the impact on volunteers and your staff, not just uh, think about people that are going to attend your church. Um, and so I think w- go slow and steady, make wise decisions, have a good reason why you're making those decisions, um, bring in your, your staff and, you know, things of that nature to make sure that everybody's on the same page. It's clear. doesn't mean everybody agrees, but it does mean everybody understands the why. And then you move forward um, slowly as a team and don't feel the pressure to make sure you have to be back at what you were ministry offerings and all of that. Maybe you don't even, here's the thing. I think churches will discover that they may not need everything that they did before because in some sense, they've been just fine without it. Mm, that's um, true. And it could be ministry. And subsequently, the scary part is that could also be applicable to staff. I'm not suggesting it. I'm just saying that's kind of this unknown piece. But I think what could, if you are next gen leader or lead pastor or any other staff member, I think one of the greatest things you can do right now is seize every opportunity to keep close to your volunteers. Because when it does come time to reopen, you know, however that looks, you aren't reopening without those volunteers. And so you don't want to stay close to them just to, you know, for that purpose, but to make sure that you maintain a relationship. And this could be a really, really cool synergistic opportunity that you're relaunching something together and that it takes all of you to do all of it. Um, so I don't know, I, for whatever whatever that's worth, that's where my, my brain is today. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. I think that's great. And I agree with you. People need to focus on that. There's, um, you may have a ton of volunteers who, you know, your church is going to start gathering again and a bunch of them aren't going to come yet because they're, they're mm-hmm. decided that even regardless of what phase or stage your state is in, they just aren't going to feel safe yet. And you need to know that. Yep. And then there's like all new things, protocols, practices that your church will yep. probably do. that are different that they need to be trained in that too. Like our executive pastor just talked about, Hey, when we go back, think how many months off our volunteers have had. So even if nothing changed, there's a sense yeah. of like, we probably need some, some warm up <laughs> time, you know, to yeah. get back in the room yeah. again. And yet you That's added right. all this change on top of it. Well, how about, how can people connect with you where you can get the book? I mean, I got it from Amazon, which is pretty much where most yeah. people get their books today. And then also tell yeah. us, you got a couple other books coming out in the fall. We'll probably have you back on to talk about. Yeah. So thanks for asking. So on social media, any Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, it's all Jason Young Live, L-I-V-E. Um, and then website, jasonyounglive.com. The Comeback Effect totally can get it at Amazon. It's probably the best place. And then the Volunteer Effect, I know, so creative. <laughs> <laughs> um, written for, you know, those that are staff or, or just lead volunteers, whether you do it as a volunteer or not. That is for you uh, coming out on September 1st. And then the Volunteer Survival Guide written to volunteers, kind of a Q&A resource on how you can be the best volunteer, build the best relationships, and give your very best. Um, and maybe there are questions that you're afraid to ask. And we thought, you know what, we'll just, we'll just go, go right at them and ask it. So that comes out in, uh, uh, towards the end of October. So yeah, they can connect me with anyway. Probably easiest way is jasonyounglive.com. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast to talk all about this and uh, the work you're doing in that area, your experience in those churches, you know, invaluable for sure. So we appreciate, you know, having your time and learning from your experience. Thank you, Nick. Well, it really was great to have Jason Young on the podcast. I kind of enjoyed having him and Jonathan in different conversations and be able to talk through the Comeback Effect book and even more than that, right? So here are a few action items I thought of coming out of that interview One would be, I mentioned at the beginning, we're having this new family retention webinar on Thursday. So whether you watch it live or on replay, you can do that and then get the retention plan itself. Get the bundle, 
And if you can't, you know, spend that money right now, the $25, it's going to go up to a hundred. So you want to spend it now if you can. If you can't, definitely watch the webinar because you'll get a lot of the same content for free. That's part of what we like to do is have, you know, a free option for most of the things we do with Ministry Boost and then start to build your retention plan. How are you going to help guests come back and then get Jason's book, The Comeback Effect, and maybe even use it to build a training for your volunteers because a lot of the book is really about the experience, what it feels like, the culture. Not so much the steps and the systems and the processes that we talk about in the retention plan, and both matter a lot. So maybe get that book and build a training for your volunteers with it. And then just one simple action step I thought of was uh, when your church is gathering again in person, or even if this there's some version online you know, that this needs to look like, who is one person that can travel with that guest all the way through the process so that we're not handing them off you know, to two or three different people, whether they have kids and they got to check in here and then they got to go here. Is it possible to have one guest, you know, or one person lead that guest all the way through? I think that'd be something interesting to consider. So you can get all the links and notes and all that at nickblevins.com slash episode 191. For sure, we hope to see you on on the webinar or maybe watch the replay. And I hope the retention, new family retention kit will be something that'd be helpful to your church. Also check out nickblevins.com slash servehq for the huddle up tool for communicating with your team. That's a great uh, organization there that's doing a lot to serve churches. We've talked a lot about their trained up resource for training volunteers online. So you can check that out as well. Thanks for listening. I hope you're doing well during this season. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I hope it's helpful to you and maybe in the midst of hopefully connecting with people in your church and thinking about the days when you're going to gather in person again and planning for that and what needs to change and what needs to adapt. Maybe there's a little time where you're working on your ministry. And if that's the case, I hope this is helpful to you. So Hope you have a great week, and I'll catch you next time on the Family Ministry Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Nick Blevins Family Ministry Podcast. We hope this helps you maximize your church's potential. We would love to hear stories of how you apply what you've learned. You can do that by leaving a comment on iTunes or in the show notes at nickblevins.com.